Hi, I'm Jeff Fordson of JeffCars.com, host of Auto Trends with JeffCars.com. Over the years, I've shared my car buying advice with such staples as the Washington Post, Black Enterprise, Essence, and AOL.com. And I've also used my high energy car buying clinic, which is housed with the Library of Congress, to help consumers navigate the car buying process. And now, each month, you can join me in the passenger seat listening in to some of my in-depth interviews with some of the auto industry leading pioneers and influencers, get the inside scoop on the latest new cars, learn about the most current recalls, and grab a service tip to keep you and your ride on the road. So for now, buckle up and enjoy the ride as we take a spin together exploring all facets of the automotive industry. Today, we're continuing the second part of our In the Driver's Seat conversation with one of the leading authorities on self-driving vehicles, and we'll take a spin in the 2016 Chevy Corvette Stingray Convertible. But first up, Shelly will tell you about the latest recalls. In the news this week, we'll bring you recalls from Pontiac, Mazda, and Toyota, and we'll tell you how to register your tires to keep abreast of any current or future recalls. First up, Toyota, Scion, and Pontiac are recalling 2 million model year 2009 to 2011 Tundras, Sequoias, Corollas, Corolla Matrixes, and Scion XBs, 2008 to 2011 Highlanders and Highlander Hybrids, 2007 Camrys and Camry Hybrids, 2006 to 2011 RAV4s, 2006 to 2010 Toyota Yaris's, 2009 to 2010 Scion XDs, and Pontiac Vibes. The driver's side power window master switch may not perform as designed due to an improper installation. An electrical fire could occur. Toyota and General Motors will notify affected owners to inspect the power window master switch. The recall is expected to begin on December 20th, 2015. Next on our list is from Mazda, where 1.4 million model year 1989 to 1998 MPVs, 1990 to 1995 323s, 1990 to 1998 Proteges, 1992 to 1993 MX3s, 1993 to 1995 929s, 1993 to 1997 MX6s, and 1993 to 1998 626 vehicles are affected. The ignition switch may overheat, increasing the risk of a fire. To address the issue, Mazda will begin notifying owners on December 15th. And switching to tire news, in a recent study, investigators found that in the tire industry, there is currently no unified system in place for consumers to be alerted of a tire recall, which could help to reduce tire-related accidents and deaths. While dealers and distributors controlled by the tire manufacturer are required to register newly purchased tires, no such requirement exists for independent dealers and distributors, which is where most Americans purchase tires. As a result of this study, the National Transportation Safety Board has made nine recommendations to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to improve registration and recall processes. To get ahead of the issue, Call the tire manufacturer directly and register your tires so that you can be alerted of any outstanding or future recalls. Recall repairs are always free and should be performed by an authorized dealership. To find out more about the noted recalls or to check for recalls on your vehicle, access the 17-digit vehicle identification number, which is located on the white label inside of the driver's door. Once the number has been retrieved, visit safercar.gov or jeffcars.com. Also, every Monday, the latest weekly recalls are announced on jeffcars.com. For Auto Trends with jeffcars.com, I'm Shelly Danzi. And Jeff, back over to you. Next up, second part of our two-part interview about self-driving vehicles. Today we have with us again uh, Jane Anderson, who's back with us for part two of our show. 
as we talk about self-driving vehicles. He's one of the leading authorities in the country who knows a lot about them, who spent uh, time actually studying it with the whole group. He's a member of the RAND Corporation. He's also a, a trained lawyer from Yale, and he's also a professor. So we're going to uh, pick up on our conversation that we started on last week where we talked a little bit about self-driving vehicles. We're going to get more into detail as far as how, it, uh, how we actually view it and see it as part of, of our future. Um, we made some comparisons last time to how we started from the, the Flintstones generation where Fred and Barney actually used their feet uh, to, as brakes. Uh, to move it forward to the Jetsons, who gave us a glimpse of self-driving vehicles. So, James, thanks for uh, staying around with us as we uh, continue part two of our intriguing conversation as we move forward with uh, self-driving vehicles. So, James, give us a view, give us a picture. When do you expect for um, there to be a sizable number of self-driving vehicles on the road, just based upon your insight? Well, it really depends in part on, on uh, what you mean by self-driving. Uh, that may be uh, too uh, uh, lawyerly of, a, of an answer. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, there, there's still a lot of uncertainty about uh, the, the time frame uh, for a, a car that is completely driverless, that can just drive around by itself without any human intervention at all. Um, uh, on regular roads everywhere uh, that there are regular roads, and that's a that's a that's a tough engineering problem, uh, and there are a lot of uh, smart people working really hard on it, um, but uh, but we don't know yet exactly when that will happen. Uh, what does seem uh, to be uh, much more likely in the, in the pretty near future uh, are cars that can drive themselves under certain conditions on, on roads. So, for example, uh, in uh, traffic jams, uh, cars that can that can take over with with relatively limited uh, human oversight, um, uh, I, I think will be available uh, certainly within the next five years. Uh, similarly, on uh, on highways and just sort of normal, um, un- relatively uncongested uh, highway driving, where the, the car could could take over again with with uh, human oversight, but um, but the car could do the uh, you know the, the, the vast majority of the driving by itself, um, and then on sort of uh, 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 those closed campuses, uh, so um, uh, maybe uh, colleges um, uh, or or the like, where you could have completely driverless uh, shuttles. Uh, yeah, but again, not necessarily operating on uh, publicly accessible roadways in uh, in with regular cars and trucks. But um, uh, but we'll see different manifestations of the technology uh, uh, over the next five years. But but the the uh, the predictions about full autonomy all the time, everywhere, without any human intervention at all. Uh, that's a that's a tougher problem, and it's 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 very hard to make a prediction about that. Okay, and I know we wrapped up last uh, last week's show talking about the infrastructure. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the insurance industry, and you're a Yale-trained lawyer, so let's take it from the standpoint of the legal liability. So if I'm in a self-driven uh, vehicle, what happens from an insurance standpoint? Am I at liability, or is the automaker who sold me the car at liability? Uh, does the thing shift from that standpoint, and do costs shift from that standpoint? Should I expect my insurance premiums to actually decrease as a result of me being in a self-driving vehicle, and if the computer is actually controlling the vehicle, controlling vehicle A, and also controlling vehicle B, and we may uh, and and there may be an accident that occurs, uh, who's at fault here? Is it uh, or is it the automaker at fault, the OEM, or the company with the telematics who got the vehicles talking to one another, or is it still my responsibility as as the individual who who have purchased the vehicle? And I guess I'm making a comparison. It's almost like being in a uh, on an airplane, and is the pilot responsible for uh, the plane uh, ultimately, or is the computer ultimately responsible for the plane? Well, if in the last question I gave a long answer to a short question, this time I'll give you a short answer to a long question. Okay. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, yeah, uh, yes, so yes, meaning, those, yes meaning what, James? Uh, well, that's what I'll, I'll explain. Okay. Um, but uh, yes meaning all of those parties possibly might be liable. Uh, so to, to cover a couple things in your questions, one uh, one of the key benefits of this of this technology is that you, you, we certainly anticipate seeing a, a, a substantial reduction in crashes uh, and in fatalities, and and that's just because uh, uh, humans uh, are, have their imperfections as drivers, and and uh, and there are an awful lot. I mean, in, in the United States, there there are uh, more than thirty thousand fatalities every year worldwide. That's something like one point two four million fatalities every year. 
here. Uh, so that's a, that's a lot of uh, death. Uh, that uh, could be avoided, um, uh, at least in part, uh, by automation. So, so, so the the overall number of crashes, uh, I, I think almost everyone uh, expects them to go down uh, significantly. Um, as to as to who will be at fault uh, and and found to be at fault uh, when the crashes uh, do occur, uh, that's un- unclear. Uh, even today, uh, we we sort of uh, conventionally attribute the responsibility of a crash usually to one driver or the other. Um, uh, but uh, even today, that's um, you know that's that's somewhat artificial, uh, and in in the right context, uh, uh, equipment OEMs and and uh, automakers are are brought in and are sued, um, uh, and so the uh, I, I think what you will likely see is is a shift away from uh, blaming the other driver sort of reflexively and automatically to, uh, which, you know, in some ways makes less sense if the car is doing the driving. It seems kind of crazy to, to blame the particular the driver. Um, to a larger focus on uh, the uh, the automaker, um, uh, you know, but that larger percentage might be of a smaller overall pool of crashes. So you should see fewer crashes of the the crashes that the automakers may take on a larger uh, portion of that responsibility. Uh, but uh, but it's you know it's it, it's hard to know. Um, and and the, and just a, a fact about the liability system. So the, you know the liability system isn't. Uh, there's not sort of a, a, a pre-set up system where one party is at fault and no other parties are at fault. It, re- it really depends on the circumstances of the crash uh, and the decisions by the the litigant by the by the plaintiff uh, as to as to who to sue. Uh, and if, if they can convince uh, a, a set of you know a, a, a group of 12 jurors that another party was uh, was unreasonable, uh, then uh, then the, and, and the court uh, could find liability. So it's a it's a relatively flexible system already that doesn't necessarily point fingers at and, and find one party alone as being responsible. I was hoping that we could put the responsibility as a consumer who may be purchasing one of these vehicles in the future, that I could put the responsibility on someone else and I would no longer bear that responsibility. That's the answer I was looking for. But obviously, I I know (laughs) that. I I mean, it's hard to say. Uh, And, you know, and and in the near future, I would anticipate, uh, I mean, we we do have a, a, you know, a a very well-developed system of automobile insurance laws in this country. And there's this, again, this large um, uh, infrastructure um, uh, and by infrastructure, not not roadways, but but uh, sort of economic infrastructure uh, uh, that is devoted to allocating the cost of crashes. Uh, and so I, I, I suspect that that will be with us for quite some time. Okay. So now we, uh, you've mentioned uh, previously about some of the benefits for self-driving cars. So you obviously mentioned uh, saving lives. I heard you mention also earlier as far as uh, uh, reducing the amount of fuel that we, we utilize, making the vehicles more uh, fuel efficient. Uh, also, what are some of the other advantages as it relates to drunk driving? Or is there an advantage? Can I now be in a self-driving vehicle or self-autonomous or an autonomous vehicle? And it drives me home. Let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, also- sure, sure. Well, I mean, I, I think there are a couple uh, advantages along those lines. One is um, uh, uh, is that if people do uh, uh, drink too much and are, are and and reduce their already, uh, I mean, as as, as humans, we're, we're certainly not as good as as uh, uh, computers at certain things. Um, and, uh, and, and alcohol or drugs, of course, makes, makes us even worse at, at, a, at a lot of the things that are associated with driving. So, um, uh, you know, the things like automatic braking that you're already beginning to see the introduction of uh, would help uh, reduce the uh, risk of, uh, of, the, of those impairments. Now, for the foreseeable future, uh, in most of the visions of automation, uh, you're going to still want a human driver uh, uh, involved. And so, and and uh, that would be it. Would be a lot better if that human driver was ready to take over and was not impaired at all. So I think it's going to be quite some time before we see a level of automation uh, that allows uh, uh, you know sort of safe uh, drunk uh, uh, passenger riding. Um, so I, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, count on that anytime real soon. Um, uh, but in other ways, in the in the enhanced uh, safety uh, provided through automatic braking and the like, I think you, you will see some benefits for them from that. Okay. What about also for uh, seniors? Uh, will we need age restrictions now 
for driving if seniors with seniors that will this be enhanced mobility for seniors and also what about for those who are physically challenged or handicapped um yeah no this... i think that's a i think that's a huge issue and that's a that's a great question jeff um uh, uh there's a uh, youtube video up on uh uh now that that shows a uh, blind person uh riding in uh in the google car and and i i, I think uh, they go to a drive through at uh, at taco bell um, and, uh, and and sort of highlights and, and exemplifies the uh, enormous uh, mobility enhancing benefits uh, of this technology. Uh, again, I think we're we're a little ways away before we you know, we actually get uh, those benefits, and it would be safe for someone uh, um, who is blind to, uh, uh, to to drive. Um, but I think there there are enormous benefits along those lines, and and it's 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 sort of easy to forget. But there there are millions of, of Americans who, uh, for a variety of reasons, don't uh, don't drive or don't have driver's license, and and and. Uh, and that has huge uh, public health implications in the uh, in the kind of uh, services that they have access to, uh, and so uh, so this this technology really does have uh, uh, potentially enormous benefits in terms of enhancing mobility for those populations. So as we talk about enhancing mobility, let's also talk about we know uh, another thing that comes along is reducing congestion. Let's talk about how this will affect the future of transportation. If we all have self-driving vehicles, then will there still be a need for public transportation? for buses, for subway systems, for trains. Uh, let's talk about how this all plays into the future of self-driving vehicles. Yeah, no, those are, those are also really good questions. Um, you know, and it, it's hard to say. Uh, on the one hand, uh, self-driving cars could uh, reduce congestion in, in, a, in a variety of ways. Uh, one, uh, uh, computers just need, you can put more cars on any given stretch of roadway if computers are doing the driving because they don't need uh, the big gaps between vehicles that human drivers do. Uh, so you just take uh, your everyday road, suddenly you could probably put, uh, you know, at least twice and, and maybe more uh, uh, vehicles on it without changing the actual infrastructure at all. Um, um, of course, that makes a lot of assumptions for, you know, one, that all the, all the cars are talking to each other. Um, and so you don't, you're not in a sort of a mixed driving situation where you have some cars that are conventionally driven. And, of course, those cars will still require full, full, uh, uh, full spacing and, and regular conventional spacing. Um, the other set of issues is that uh, if the, um, uh, the marginal cost, if the cost to the driver of driving long distances goes down because suddenly they can just you know hit autopilot and text or watch a movie or do whatever it is that they want to do, uh, you might see longer and longer and longer commutes become more viable. So uh, you know right now uh, most people seem to think uh, about an hour, hour and 15 minutes is kind of the outside limit of uh, the, the distance that they're willing to commute. Um, it, you might see uh, much longer commutes if, if, the, uh, if the person can do other things in, uh, in, the, in the vehicle. And so, of course, that could lead to more congestion rather than less. Um, so it's not, it's not clear uh, um, at this point uh, whether this technology will lead to, to more congestion or less. The other sort of important uh, variable there is the, the rise of shared vehicles. Uh, um, uh, Uber and Lyft and the, and the like um, have, uh, have changed patterns of transportation in some places. Uh, and if you had a uh, uh, an Uber just in, in Pittsburgh recently um, uh, uh, hired a, a, a large number of uh, robotic engineers who know this technology really well uh, and seem to be uh, working on uh, developing their own version of, uh, of self-driving vehicles. Uh, so if you have shared vehicles uh, operating, um, uh, again, that's another, that may have, um, uh, that may re end up reducing congestion substantially rather than having uh, individually owned ones. Interesting. So James, what states are currently allowing self-driving vehicles? Um, well, so there's, that's also a, uh, an excellent question. I mean, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a, a good argument that they're, um, they're currently allowed uh, in, in almost all the states, uh, except where they've been explicitly uh, regulated. Um, uh, yeah, California, uh, Michigan, uh, Florida, and I think D.C., if I re remember correctly. Aren't they doing uh, a little study in Texas right now also with self-driving vehicles in Austin? I think. Uh, yes, they are. Okay. They are, but it's... It's not clear that that uh, that you need to pass laws to allow them, um, uh, and, and and there's a there's an argument that they're uh, sort of already allowed, 
um, uh, and and so at least for testing. Um, and oh, that's right, Nevada was the other state that had, uh, passed sort of a specific uh, regime about uh, about about these cars. Now, how does a self-driving vehicle versus uh, those that are still controlled by humans, how do they interact with one another? Or what's the impact with uh, having those two together on the road? What are you hearing from from current reports? Uh, well, again, it, it can be complicated, right? I mean, uh, if you had a fully automated system, it, it, it certainly simplifies things. Uh, and then, then you can sort of set up clear rules. Uh, and, and the like. Um, uh, some of the, the, it's the real challenges that the, that the folks who do the, the design the algorithms uh, for these vehicles face is, uh, you know, how do you deal with situations uh, where uh, uh, humans uh, don't necessarily follow the rules? Uh, you know, so in some places, you, you sort of have to be relatively aggressive in pulling out uh, into traffic, even though there's not necessarily a gap um, uh, that's sort of pre-existing, because otherwise, and you have to kind of count on the on the uh, other driver to slow down and give you give you room to merge, because otherwise you'll just you'll just sit, sit there forever. Um, and there's there's some concern uh, that uh, that this is certainly going to be one of the challenges that, that self-driving cars will face. Uh, I, most engineers I've, I've talked to seem optimistic that they'll uh, be able to surmount it, uh, but it is a challenge. Okay, now you know we've heard of uh, there's been a few accidents that's occurred around the country with self-driving vehicles, and from what we're hearing is that it's not the fault of the telematics or the, the robotics, but it's the fault of just an average day conventional driver like myself who may have caused an accident. What, what are you hearing about this? Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. Um, uh, you know, humans aren't. I mean, we're not horrible drivers, but we're not we're not great drivers. There's an awful lot of uh, crashes that occur all the time, and so uh, you know, so it's not it's not especially surprising that uh, uh, that the crashes uh, that we that we've heard about thus far have been uh, the fault of humans. And, and, and it's also important. I mean, Google is very proud of the fact that they uh, have something like a million, over a million miles of on-mile testing. But that, you know, in the in the world of the overall number of miles traveled in the United States by car, that's, that's uh, you know, uh, really just a drop in the bucket. I understand. Okay. So when we talk about uh, autonomous vehicles and we also talk about the features that we're getting closer to, when we look at uh, some of today's vehicles, it has the radar activated cruise control system, the lane keep assist system, the blind spot technology, uh, all the lane changing technology, the forward braking and collision alert system, which all assist the driver in maintaining control of the vehicle and reduce the ac uh, reduce an accident. Uh, we also know that to have those features, it usually drives up the price of the vehicle because of technology. So what are you hearing about what does an average self-driving vehicle cost, the few that's on the road today? What's the cost of those right now? Well, you know, I, I don't know. Um, but I, I think I think the point you raise is, a, is an excellent one, that there that there's some real sort of social equity issues uh, in uh, the way this technology um, uh, uh, you know might get rolled out. Uh, and uh, I, I do know that at least some auto, uh, automakers, I think Toyota, has sort of publicly committed to offering uh, automatic braking, for example, uh, on all of their models uh, for a relatively uh, uh, modest uh, fee. My, my recollection was it was about $250 or something, uh, rather than um, uh, making it a, a you know a multi-thousand-dollar option only available on their on their super fancy cars. Um, so you know that's at least uh, there appears to be some recognition uh, that uh, it would be unfortunate and you'd lose a lot of the social benefits of this technology if it was just available uh, on, a, on a very small proportion of the of the fleet. Um, and, and that gets into a point that that, uh, that you raised in your earlier question about the effect of this technology on uh, on mass transit and, and public transit more generally, and and uh, and that also remains a, a, an important unanswered question. Uh, I mean, there's there's some risk that this technology could uh, uh, sort of cannibalize um, uh, existing uses of. Uh, public transit. If, and if uh, you know, if I can read in my uh, comfy personal car, maybe I won't take uh, the train or the bus um, because right now, uh, being able to do other things is kind of a key comparative advantage of public transit. 
so there there are some risks about uh, from and again sort of in the in the social equity uh, uh, area uh, from this technology. Well, James, we're going to bring this to a quick close, so I need to get a quick answer for you on this. Is what happens when the whole computer system just doesn't work at all? And we've seen that in airports where a particular airline, uh, their computer system isn't working and it shut down the entire airline system. So how does it apply to self-driving vehicles? Well, it sort of depends on how the system's designed. Uh, I think most of the most of the, the views would be that uh, this would be um, uh, really uh, you know auto by auto dependent. So there would be so if the if the system failed in one automobile, uh, most likely it wouldn't it wouldn't fail in, in other autos. Um, but it, you know it, that's uh, you know you certainly wouldn't have to design the system that way. And and you know one of the concerns on the insurance front would be if there was a you know some kind of bug or flaw that affected not just one vehicle uh, but uh, you know a large portion of the fleet at the same time. Uh, that, you know, that could obviously be catastrophic. Okay. Hey, James, thank you very much for giving us an insight from your perspective and spending time with uh, self-driving vehicles and also being a part of this uh, major uh, think tank government study and, and kind of preparing us for what we know is inevitable at this point. I know we're moving into uh, the, the Jetsons uh, territory at this point, again, with uh, the forward collision braking system, with the radar-activated cruise control system, uh, even when we look at uh, rear backup cameras, which are uh, becoming standard or on more and more vehicles these days. So again, thank you for your insight. Thanks for uh, the, the extensive two-part interview. And uh, if we've got any other questions in the future, you know we'll reach back out to you. Well, really, my pleasure, Jeff. And, and feel free to contact me whenever you'd like. Okay, again, thanks for uh, joining us on autotranswithjeffcars.com. Thanks a lot, James, and have a great day. You too, Jeff. Next up, new car reviews. In the garage this week, we have our hands on the Corvette Stingray. Since the current generation Corvette Stingray made its debut at the North American International Auto Show in 2013, we've been eagerly waiting to get behind the wheel. And this wasn't just a standard Corvette Stingray, which would have been okay with us. This one was a vibrant torch red, seven speed manual with a hands-free power operated convertible soft top. For us, a manual transmission and a drop top just up the ante, adding to the fun factor. This was just what the doctor ordered and for those who aren't interested in shifting through seven gears of heaven, or in our case, six gears of heaven, a clutchless automatic transmission with paddle shifters is available. Now, while our vehicle was outfitted with a 6.2 liter eight cylinder engine, which spewed out 450 horsepower, those thrill seekers yearning for more oomph should be able to fulfill their desire by stepping up to the pricier Z06 trim, which unleashes a whopping 650 horsepower. That should be enough to tickle anyone's fancy. It definitely would be for us. So to get back on track, no pun intended, we found the Corvette Stingray standard engine with the seven gears to be more than enough for us. In fact, we never used the seven gear. In our eyes, it just screamed the danger zone. So by all accounts, it's safe to assume by not shifting beyond the sixth gear, this allowed us to remain street legal and steer clear from drawing any additional unwarranted attention and speeding tickets too. The 6.2 liter engine we reviewed with the spirited manual transmission was outfitted with an optional Z51 package, which consisted of a performance suspension, 19 inch front and 20 inch rear black painted aluminum wheels, a rear differential cooler, a multi-mode performance exhaust system, a dry sump oil system and performance brakes. Ironically, outfitting the Corvette Stingray with the Z51 package changed the driving dynamics, the sound, and the overall look of this already hot drop top. So, with the Z51 package, this further accentuates what many enthusiasts really care about, the speed. Yes, the speed is one of the key components that define each sports car. Fortunately, the Corvette Stingray, which clocked 200 miles per hour on the digital speedometer, pulls through like a workhorse in this area. Our street legal hot rod was capable of zooming from zero to 60 in less than four seconds, according to one of our reliable sources. Unfortunately, we would have preferred being able to capture and record the speed without relying on a source had the proper SIM card been available to install in our optional performance data and video recorder. The performance data and video recorder really comes in handy when the car is being turned over to the valet especially one that is looking to horse around the vehicle. Thank God, Big Brother's always around. 
Pricing for the Corvette Stingray with a hardtop starts out the gate at $56,395. Our Corvette Stingray convertible with the Z51 package listed for $79,415. For photos, pricing, and additional information about the Corvette Stingray or other new vehicles, drive over to jeffcars.com. Until next time, buckle up. The executive producer and host of Auto Trends with JeffCars.com is Jeff Fortson, and the production manager is John Bill. To hear the extended version of our In the Driver's Seat interview, drive over to JeffCars.com. To stay connected, sign up for our e-automotive newsletter, or join us on Twitter at JeffCars. Until next month, buckle up and drive safely.